Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome, both in person here in North Great Georgia Street, and for those of you who are joining us online. My name is John O'Brennan. I'm a professor of Maynooth University, and I'm delighted to chair this afternoon's special event on European Union enlargement and the Western Balkans. Time to recalibrate, question mark. I think most of us agree it is time to recalibrate enlargement policy. We are delighted to welcome back to Dublin and to the Institute, Dr. Kurt Bassooner. Kurt, I'm sure is known to many of you who follow the Western Balkans and enlargement debates. Uh, he is the co-founder and a senior research associate of the Democratization Policy Council, which is a Berlin-based think tank, which has been around for the last 18 years or so. Kurt received his PhD from St. Andrews University in Scotland in 2021. Um, he was based there at the Center for the Study of Terrorism and Political Violence, one of the leading such academic um, units in the world. He is co-author and the research director of the Diplomat's Handbook for Democracy Development Support. He lived in Sarajevo for 11 or 12 years, I think. Um, and he has a very, very deep knowledge of the region. He was at one point an advisor to Paddy Ashdown, who many of you will remember, the Liberal Democrat leader who became the European Union's high representative, so-called in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we're delighted to host um, Kurt. His uh, Democratization Policy Council does extraordinarily important work publishing policy briefs on the Western Balkans, all of it based on the deep knowledge, experience and engagement with the region of people like Kurt and his colleagues. This is the way this afternoon's session will unfold. I will shortly invite Kurt uh, to speak. He's going to speak for about 20 minutes or so. We're then going to settle into questions and answers, a sort of back and forth between us, and then we'll open the session to our audience, both in person and online, um, if they have any questions. If you are online, I would say, um, please use the Q&A function on Zoom towards the bottom of your screen. And those questions will be fed through to me and I can feed them through uh, to Kurt. A reminder that today's session is on the record and um, that applies equally to our conversation subsequently. So without further ado, Kurt, it's a great pleasure to welcome you back to the Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, thank you very much, John. It's a pleasure to be back here at the Institute after about a decade. Um, pleasure to meet Kian and Barry and to see Tony Brown again, who I've not seen since I was last here. Um, and I also want to recognize uh, Valerie Hughes, whose tireless efforts, uh, first of all, helped make the stars align for, for this visit, but also uh, is active, constantly running in the background for human rights and human dignity, not just in the Balkans, but in Syria and elsewhere. Um, as John noted, I'll try to present you with a frame uh, to discuss uh, for our discussion a brief statement of the situation in Democratization Policy Council's view, answering the event title, and we could do that up front. Yes, it's time to recalibrate. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, followed, followed by a, a chronological uh, enumeration of how we got here and how we could get out of it. Um, we're in a deeply negative and degenerating dynamic in the Western Balkans right now. Um, due in large measure to the policies and actions of the European Union and its Western allies toward the region. Worse yet, rather than using the geopolitical shock of Russia's full-scale invasion uh, attempt to crush and absorb Ukraine in the colonial war as a rationale uh, to finally disengage the bureaucratic autopilot that the policy toward the Western Balkans has been on for, I would argue, 17 years, and undertake a course correction, um, 
The West policies have simply accelerated on the course that was determined prior to February 24th last year. Uh, a self-defeating and self-corrupting path, I would argue. The aggregate trends li trend lines according to a host of indicators, the freedom houses, freedom in the world, nations in transit, but you could look at transparent international internationals, um, league tables, committee to pre protect journalists, all of these paint a pretty dire picture of the operating environment for the values that we proclaim we hold dear in, in this region where uh, the European Union in particular, but the West more broadly has been the dominant geopolitical actor for a quarter of century. Um, so uh, these indicators include democratic practice and it's been a protracted period that they've been negative. It's not a, a recent turn. Um, Accelerating emigration from the region uh, also speaks to popular views on the possibility of living with dignity um, and positive change to actually make that possible where they where they where they live now. So the possibility of dissent and to organize violence in the Western Balkans is real. Uh, this does not represent some sort of underlying inherent societal malady of these societies, but rather their protracted malgovernance and the incentives under which the leaders are able to govern, what they've been presented both from without and systemically from within. Uh, so the essential question for the European Union and its Western allies, including the United States, Britain, and others, is this. How could a region in which we, that is the European Union, United States, Britain, NATO, have been dominant external actors uh, where we have an unparalleled toolbox, potential potency, and the leverage of our proclaimed democratic human rights rule of law values. Um, how could we be on the back foot? How could the security dynamic be so, and political dynamic be so negative after so long? Um, where and where the geo, our geopolitical adversaries are increasingly present as factors. What does that reflect on us? Um, I think the, the, the premises of the European Union's engagement in the Western Balkans need to be recapitulated so we can revisit them. About 20 years ago, as the Big Bang enlargement was approaching in Thessaloniki in 2003, 20 years ago, um, there was transatlantic friction with the United States and Britain over Iraq and within the European Union itself. Um, but those transatlantic frictions actually led to a meeting of a division of labor with the Western Balkans effectively. With the European Union taking the lead, enlargement will, will take these, these countries the rest of the way in their transitions. Um, and But that came with what was baked into the source code of the European Union from its very foundation, which is an elite focus, a presumption that the societies uh, are represented through their political elites, that their accountability mechanisms, and therefore what the EU is offering these societies and these leaders will allow a self-propelling self dynamic toward, toward European Union standards and Euro-Atlantic integration as the term of art became at the time. Um, with that, and probably not divorced at all from, from the Iraq frictions, um, became came a theological view of how these things should be done. For example, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, this is perhaps clearest, um, you have executive tools to enforce the Dayton Peace Agreement. Those are the international high representative. And up until the end of 2004, a, ch a chapter seven authorized military deterrent force that the European Union took on willingly, enthusiastically, uh, which is now U4. Um, but these, you're not supposed to need enforcement tools in a country with an enlargement perspective. That's theologically unsound. And so while there was resistance in the Peace Implementation Council to, uh, to eliminating them, what ended up happening is that they were just allowed to wither and rust and, and become effectively um, shadows of their former selves, legally just as valid as they always were, practically 
not as potent as they used to be uh, with the EU institutions and a large number of member states constantly trying to undercut them. So the presumptions that attended the, the EU's course starting from about 20 years ago have never been revisited. Even though the results, I think it's been, it's quite clear that this, this policy, these presumptions are self-evidently failing in the Western Balkans. Uh, and they were self-evidently failing before the financial crisis hit. Uh, so 15 years running now. So the EU collective policy response to that, that disjunct, faking it. Effectively declare forward movement in the hope uh, in the hope that that will be in the fullness of time realized, that you can make it real over time. You don't want to kill the mood. Momentum, the cult of momentum. So the partners in this, in this relationship were not the societies as a whole, but the leaderships of these individual Western Balkan six countries. And at that point, they weren't Western Balkan six. It also included Croatia. So um, you declare forward movement and you try to bridge your own cognitive dissonance with that. Um, and this is a way you def the, the EU defended its self-conception as a normative transformational power. So you couple that with significant bilateral parochialism, most clearly evident in the, in the name dispute between Greece and, and what's now North Macedonia, uh, but it's now being played out with Bulgaria and North Macedonia. And there's numerous other examples. Even in cases where the EU's own rules allowed for qualified majority voting. Traditionally, that's just not, not done. You don't want to do something by majority vote. That's, uh, and so that's, for example, one of the reasons why uh, there are no effective sanctions in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Hungary objected and shot those down, and nobody, nobody really raised a peep and made them own their veto on that uh, two years ago. So over time, you've seen a shift to a values-neutral approach. Uh, and this is particularly manifest in the way the EEAS is managing the dialogue on Serbia-Kosovo. You might, it's worth reminding ourselves how the dialogue began. It began really with Angela Merkel telling the, the current Serbian pr president's predecessor, uh, Boris Tadic, that there's no chance in hell of Serbia ever entering, entering the European Union until it recognized where its southern border was and it wasn't where its constitution said it was. Um, but now it's, it's an, it, it, what we've seen subsequently was uh, both the EEAS adopt this land swap idea in 2018, five years ago, that Trump rapidly jumped on because Merkel was on the other side of it. And I think in part it was to, to needle her. In any case, the EU inst institutions have been subcontracted to manage while member states let them manage, don't really intervene because there's most member states want to consign that uh, to the sidelines while they focus on other issues. Uh, and that's become a self-perpetuating dynamic where the EU institutions now don't even inform member states of a lot of their policies or declare that everybody's on board when there are a lot of frictions below the surface. So we had three chances in the past, in about a 13 month period to revisit this dynamic, this glide path, our trajectory. The inauguration of the Biden administration in the United States, the entry of, of the Schultz government in Germany, and February 24th last year. And the last of these, I think, is the most damning in a lot of ways, uh, because there's been greater transatlantic Western unity declaratively behind democratic values, human dignity, rule of law, and real policies to back that up facing East. A direct support to Ukraine, sanctions on Russia, et cetera. Um, and, but, so this is unprecedented since the end of the Cold War. But while these values are correctly deployed eastward, the effective policy and posture in the Western Balkans is effectively unchanged. Only the velocity and the vehemence with which they pursued has amplified. Um, so uh, you, 
you see in the societies of the Western Balkans, a lot of real loss of credibility for not only the West, but the, the idea that it stands for what it says it stands for. Nobody expects the Chinese or the Russians or the Turks to not be self-interested geopolitical actors. That's a given. And nobody's in an illusion that countries and, and groups of countries don't pursue their interests as well. But when you say we're better, we're different, we have these values, we have these standards, and then you actively undercut them in the eyes of people, um, that creates a friction that's even greater because it, it creates a, a, an element of hypocrisy, a perception of hypocrisy. So uh, what's generated the region's susceptibility to geopolitical challenge? Our posture and our policies. Uh, cu coupled with an unreconstructed, unaccountable, extractive political class in these in, that govern each of these states. At present, more effort is devoted to countermeasures against particularly Russia, but also China. And some of these countermeasures are more declarative than real in actual effect. Um, uh, then intellectual capital being devoted toward re revisiting from first principles what, what we want to achieve and then a strategy in, in order to achieve it. Um, to how do you make these countries actually move them toward democratic, accountable, and resilient self-governance that, that could be ultimately adopted into the European Union or NATO if they so desire. Um, I believe that this reveals not only a deepening cynical fatalism on the part of the established democracies uh, in the capacity of Western Balkan societies and countries to ever be liberal democracies, as well as a crisis of self-belief on our own part, and I say this as an American, uh, in the proclaimed democratic human values or at a minimum the popular resonance of those values in, in a very contested environment. So who are the beneficiaries of that? Regional ethnic party leaders, Vucic, Vucic first and foremost in Serbia, um, and uh, but he's far from alone. You have at least three, probably four, hegemonic agendas at play in, in the Western Balkans, Serbia's, Croatia's, Bulgaria via V North Macedonia, as you see playing out within the European Union, and in the sort of only at the Eddie Rama level declaratively uh, in Tirana to a certain extent, but it doesn't seem to have popular resonance in my own estimation. So, uh, the EU enlargement in the Western Balkans is no really no longer really seen as a socially transformative tool. Uh, the priority seems to be pacification. Keep it quiet. Let it not be a problem for us. Um, and to prove EU's potency and leverage to itself, not necessarily to the societies and governments in question. Um, so you see this reflected in the electoral reform process that were pursued, was pursued jointly by the US and the European Union in Bosnia, but then was ultimately imposed through the high representative. So there you had another theological friction point. It wasn't about the substance of the changes which we pursued together, but the application thereof, where you couldn't get political agreement, they were imposed, that created um, created uh, friction with the European Union and the US, between the U EU and US and Britain. You also see this, this dy dynamic reflected in the so-called Ohrid Agreement between, between the leaders of Serbia and, and Kosovo, which I put in quotation marks. I don't even really think you see any evidence there was actually an agreement at all functionally. Um, it's an aim for deliverables to demonstrate progress without actual belief in progress. Um, so fear and patronage have re-entered. They were always there, but fear is a far more salient factor than it was when Thessaloniki was proclaimed in, in 2003. Uh, and patronage is a much more potent tool. We engage in patronage ourselves. So fear is directed outward toward the external Western actors. If you don't give us what we want, we could go crazy, pay us and 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 treat us, treat us with deference. So what does this portend for the future? 
on the current pathway, it's uh, it's going to be continued generate degeneration, degrading European Union capability among the uh, excuse me credibility among the Western Balkan six citizens uh, who remain there or those citizens coming to the European Union. And a lot of countries are happy to have them for demographic and other reasons. Um, this makes those societies more secure for their elites who get more deeply entrenched as well as more susceptible to those with opposing sets of values. Uh, and these are represented within the European Union, Hungary and Orban being chief among, the yeah, exponent among them, but he's emblematic, but not alone. Uh, but this dynamic is, is hardly hidden from the West geopolitical adversaries. They see it playing out. We're not fooling anybody. Um, it's hardly hidden from the inhabitants of these countries. And to an increasing degree, it's not hidden from the EU's and, and other democracies' own citizens. So this approach endangers enlargement, including with Ukraine and Moldova, in the medium to long term. The EU seems more attached to its current operating system and comfort zone than its values, reflected in democracy, rule of law, other standards. So there's a real palpable decline in popular belief, not the values per se, but the sense that the EU and the West actually believes in them ourselves. People do, do move out to where they believe they can't, can live with dignity, Germany, Sweden, what have you. Um, and much of the EU actively seeks them. And these are not primarily economic drivers. They're part of the mix, but they're prim pr primarily human dignity drivers. I'm 53. There are people my age who are leaving, who are established, who don't have to leave, but they have one humiliation too many, and they're like, I'm out. So what is to be done? Some, e some EU member states, and uh, there is are increasing communications among like-minded who know things are going wrong, need to take this to the principles level, basically heads of government level. That's the only way, way this is going to turn around. So long as it's mired at bureaucratic level or below, her, we're stuck. Um, uh, to recognize that this policy is not only flawed, but deeply damaging and doomed. It can't succeed on its own terms. It is not possible, and therefore urgently requires revisiting and resetting. I'll wrap up here. So you know, what's my case for angry optimism? I'm not a pessimist. I know that might surprise you, given the litany I've just, I've just laid out before you. Um, but if I did not, if I believe that there wasn't a potential constituency for the values we, we proclaim as our own in these countries, I'd leave. I'm, I'm stubborn, but I'm not a masochist. Uh, I believe there's real potential for radically different social contracts in these countries, far closer to what the EU and its allies proclaim to hold dear. Making the environment conducive for those would be both embarrassing at the managerial and bureaucratic level within our governments and structures and dis disruptive. But for the latter issue, the expansive toolbox, including deterrence mandates, afforded in the post-war settlements, particularly pertaining, pertaining to Bosnia and Kosovo, and the depth of Western engagement gives us unmatched leverage to, main, to manage the potential disruption. We can control per, for potential violence, which is, the, which is most likely to be initiated from above a de, as a defensive measure by established elites. Um, and that's the only disruption that really scares me. That's the only disruption that I think would not potentially be creative disruption. Um, this doesn't assure progress, nothing is guaranteed, but it would at least make it feasible. Uh, and, it would and it would be a shield against radical regression. So I'm confident real organic progress would follow and it would be instructive to us in our own societies because a lot of the challenges we're facing and divisions in, in established democracies um, are, are things that resemble the divisions within, within these Western Balkan societies. Uh, I'll wrap up with just, I'm more optimistic on the democratic and potential for achieving a social contract in Bosnia where I live than I am in the United States right now. I know that might sound nuts, but I have far more belief that we could find a modus vivendi in Bosnia than we can in the United States amongst ourselves.
So that's the challenge. And I appreciate your patience and your attention. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you.